most people think of human trafficking, they think of something happening half a world away. And in reality, it's right here in our own backyards, big cities, small towns across America. Yeah, this is dark, this is ugly, this is inhuman, but we're human and we can stop it. Thank you for the, oh, the, the donation, thank you. It's rocking a 400 point right now. The Hell Tour face mask. This is my life chat. It's 400. We're at 400. That's so cute. I love y'all so much. Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome in. We are live today on a Monday. So our schedule is a little bit different than normal, but um, we're excited to be here. Uh, we have C in the festival starting tomorrow. If you guys have not registered, it is free online. And B will happily do all the commands for us right now. We, of course, have Patrick, the founder of C in it tonight. Um, how are you doing, Patrick? Excellent. Getting down to it, counting down, counting down the minutes until the festival launches um, tomorrow evening. It'll be it'll be launched 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, um, with uh, an incredible an incredible show. I, it just includes music, dance, films, but all of it with this messaging of we we have to become aware of human trafficking, the reality of this in our local communities. Um, that it's not just it's not just an over there problem. It's not just an over you know, those people problem. It's something that's really impacting all of us, and uh, and so this is a and an, just an incredible platform that's been put together of of musicians and artists and filmmakers and and survivors that have their testimonies and messages. Um, so it'll be covering the next six days. So from from Tuesday until Sunday evening, um, you're gonna you're gonna be in for a, a an incredible ride. And the end of it, you're gonna come out just totally pumped with with the the reality that we can end this. You know, when we come together collectively, th there's no reason why human trafficking and slavery should be existing in the year 2020. Are you with me? Um, so this is this is really the time for us to kind of step up and everyone to kind of find find where they connect. And tonight's guest, we we have this amazing um, this amazing human person who's who's our guest tonight, who has inspired me deeply ever since I first met her. Um, she is she comes from a long line of airline, an airline family, and uh, and has been a flight attendant for 19 years. Um, she is now the the co-director of human trafficking awareness for the Airline Ambassadors International, kind of a um, organization, and has been all over the world. She's um, been an in instructor for members of the industry, of flight attendants, of people engaged in and working in the airline industry. And in that, and in that, I'm just so incredibly inspired that this industry, with Andrea's hope, with Andrea Hobart's um, help and involvement, has taken on human trafficking. And this is an industry that that does see people moved around. And although human trafficking doesn't necessitate people being carried over borders and shifted around, they can be in your neighborhood, in your middle school, being trafficked. But still, an awful lot of people are being moved moved through the airline industry and through transportation and with everybody's eyes on the prize we can actually kind of see see children and see young people be be saved from what could be a horrible consequence of their lives um so i, I really wanted you to uh to welcome our guest tonight andrea hobart and and hear from her about her her life who she is and why this has become something so important to her so Andrea, welcome, welcome to see it ended on Twitch. Thank you. I'm your biggest fan. <laughs> it is a huge honor to be here. I am passionate about this fight against human trafficking, but I'm also passionate about the creative arts and seeing that kind of expression 
really just bring these messages out there and, and wake people up to what's going on, but also tell the stories of hope. Yeah. You know? So yes, I'm, I'm a flight attendant. I do come from an airline family, like Patrick just said. Uh, my grandparents on my mother's side started a flight school, a crop dusting business where they trained many, many pilots. My uncle continued that business on. And um, so I have two cousins that are pilots uh, in the family. We have a lot of airline people. And you know, that, that caught, I, I caught that bug, that aviation and that love of flying and the love of adventure, just that desire to travel, see the world and really make an impact in something was in me. So through a series of events growing up, um, after I did a trip to the Philippines overseas with my cousin, we got to explore a lot of things there and work with kids that had been rescued from the streets. Um, back then I didn't know, but I'm sure much of that had been human trafficking. And we got to see these kids, they actually uh, had a dance school and they would go and perform these beautiful dramas and dances and give hope and every eye would be crying. It was so amazing. So I came back from the Philippines uh, in school. I was barely 19 years old. And I, uh, one of my uncles that's an airline pilot told me his airline was hiring if I wanted to do that for a little bit, get, get it out of my system. And so since then, I've been a career flight attendant. And um, so that love of travel, but also that, that glimpse that I had in the Philippines of people investing in orphans and street kids and just connecting with some of the most beautiful people I've ever met really left an impact on me. Um, so that aviation is in my blood and then also just this desire to you know, do something that actually makes an impact in a positive way on the people I meet, the places I go through travels. And, um, you know, I, I think seeing and traveling and just seeing so much, I felt like I was in a movie a lot, <laughs> 19 years old. My first flight was to Tokyo and I'd never been out of the country before. And I gotten to travel all over the world as a flight attendant and uh, I literally have, have been so touched to have these really neat experiences, but also just to see humanity, different levels of poverty mm. around the world, different, just, just to be exposed to a lot as a young person, it really uh, left an imprint on me. Um, that, so that's so, it's so interesting. I, I, I often felt like keeping kids in school for 12 years and then having them go into university was just like, you know, if if after high school you had an experience of the world, how how life changing that would be. Where if you if you went and did something like the Peace Corps, you did something where you are out there meeting people around the world, how how different it would be. You come back and go to university, and you're a little bit more, you know, aware of the world that you live in. But this like, I don't know how how powerful that is as a 19 year old to actually go and see how people are living around the world. Yeah. Um, is it was radical and i think i'm a huge advocate for education I, I love it but my path was different and uh and i'm so grateful because everything that i i've been doing as far as being a flight attendant flying and has led me to this recent work that i've been a part of where where all have you been in the world i mean it, like which yeah. part of the world and which, which part of the world have, have which part of the world has, has kind of impacted you you know, and what you've seen and experienced there? Well, the Philippines in a big way, because we spent almost, my cousin and I, uh, my close cousin, Shauna and I spent almost two months traveling all over the Philippines with a group. We got to explore and be in all kinds of places. So um, seeing all levels of literally working with orphans and street yeah. kids in these groups, that uh, made a huge impact. Also the, the creative part, seeing how dance and drama and things could actually move people's heart. We got to be in some of these drama and performances. And as a young person, seeing being on the stage, seeing the impact really hit me. So Philippines, definitely. Um, I've spent a lot of time in Amsterdam on layovers with a previous airline I worked for. A lot of, uh, a lot of time there. I've spent time in Rome and in Sardinia, Italy. Uh, just beautiful. There's such beautiful cultures everywhere in Tokyo, in mm. India. I had one visit to India so far and was really uh, just had an amazing experience there. 
So uh, my first trip to India, or my trip to India was actually with Airline Ambassadors International as a young 21 year old flight attendant. <laughs> and I had heard about Airline Ambassadors and they did mission trips and orphan and medical escorts for children back then. As an airline person, you could volunteer and bring back a baby being adopted from a different country. So I got to do that. That's what brought me to India. Wow. I actually got to visit an orphanage, spend the day there and accompany an 18 month old little girl all the way back uh, to Seattle to her new parents. So yeah, that was amazing. So tell us a little about Airline Ambassadors. Like what, what all is that organization like established to do? Yeah, great question. Well, Airline Ambassadors International is a family of thousands of people, literally. There are, uh, Nancy Rivard is the founder and director and one of my great friends. We literally feel like family. And she spearheaded this movement. It's been over 20 years now and uh, just Bringing, starting out with volunteer flight attendants, going into war-torn regions, places with uh, all kinds of unrest and after natural disasters, bringing aid. And a lot of it was helping vulnerable children and things like that. And it led to the formation of this organization, which is made up of a lot of airline professionals, flight attendants, but anybody can volunteer. So there's uh, students and um, all kinds of people, even representing other organizations that are a part of Airline Ambassadors. And uh, it's made up with three groups. So there's humanitarian mission trips. I've gotten to help uh, lead one to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, near a garbage dump site that's become a whole village of children that have been educated, really powerful. So there's the mission trips, there's the orphan and medical escorts. And then in 2009, I believe, uh, airline ambassadors started embarking on a human trafficking awareness program, training airlines on how to recognize and report evidence of human trafficking, whether it's in an airport or on a plane. And uh, so I heard about airline ambassadors initially early on in my career. And then it was in 2013, I found out about the human trafficking awareness program. I connected with Nancy and uh, we did a uh, big training, an educational couple of days in Washington, D.C. It was an intensive where all kinds of people representing uh, one from Shared Hope International. We had other organizations that spoke. We had survivor leaders speak. And we just, as a group of about 25 uh, flight attendants, learned how to bring, to, to start raising awareness. And now I've been a co-director with my good friend Donna Hubbard who is a survivor leader um, of this program where we've gotten, uh, we have a team of many, many advocates, airline professionals and uh, survivors of human trafficking, where we will go all over the world to airports and airlines and we'll lead awareness training sessions. We'll have uh, often a testimony of a survivor leader um, we'll also have representatives from law enforcement and other experts that are also on the front lines uh, really doing this. And, and as flight attendants, as the airline voice, we're, that's our platform. We can speak from our own platform of being on the airplane, our own experience, and how to integrate that into our already uh, training, safety training that we have in place in the airlines. I have a quick question from chat. Is this organization um, national or international? It's an international organization. Wow. Yeah, so Airline Ambassadors International, we have uh, our mission trips, our humanitarian missions. Mm -hmm. We have several representing uh, some projects here in the United States, but also in uh, South, South and Central America, in Asia, in uh, now in Africa, and uh, in Haiti. In Ecuador, we have many, many projects that we're invested in and that Airline Ambassadors supports throughout the world. The Philippines also. How do you first learn about human trafficking? Was it when the program was offered or like, do you always like had an interest in it? You know, um, I, I learned about it probably in I, maybe around 2007, 2008. It's, I started to hear about it, and I have a great mentor and friend in my life. Uh, he has a business of his own, but they really invest in supporting 
um, the Not For Sale organization and really cre helping create jobs for survivors and people that are vulnerable all over the world. So I learned about it from him. I also learned about it from a good friend of mine. I'm not sure if she's watching tonight, Megan. She lives in Honolulu, Hawaii, and she was very invested in, in this kind of work and it just planted that seed. So I began to look for opportunities and I was able to reconnect after several years with airline ambassadors. And I found out that they were uh, gonna be holding a conference in Phoenix, Arizona. And this was, you know, actually it was in 2013 where I traveled to, met Nancy, and within a short amount of time, just really uh, started learning, educating myself. One of my main, uh, my main priorities is to see that survivors of human trafficking, these leaders, are given the platform to to be the leaders and to share. They're the, really the ones that that know and can give that kind of in-depth educating and awareness to other people of what it is. And that's been um, something I've I've just been so blown away by many of my friends that are survivors and what they're doing. Yeah, I think you you have such a unique platform, and I think it, it, also just personally. Yeah, I mean the 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 blessing that it is to to actually have have gone to so many different parts of the world, and to see our commonness, which I think, you know, we we kind of like have that in America. We're we're just kind of this this pot of people that have all been brought together and thrown together here. But when you actually go and see how people are living in different parts of the world, and it's like th there's this this common thread that that ties us all together as human beings. And I and I think, you know, having that experience and exposure would just give you so much kind of empowerment to want to do this work. I mean, you see, you know, it's not just, it's not just the kids in your local community that are suffering, but kids that are, that are being exposed to this and are being exploited in other parts of the world, in like India, Philippines. Um, and then to see the commonness of it, that just kind of abusing children anywhere, like the, the misuse of, of a human life is, is so significant. And, and it's not just something that's only of local concern. It's not something that's only of global concern, but it's really, you know, kind of the, the all of it together as humanity. And I think you have such a heart for humanity because of, I mean, many things, but I think in part, you've had this experience of being able to see people around the world. Yeah. And, and like, how do, you, how do you feel that that's kind of affected your, your heart for, for victims of human trafficking? Yeah, I, uh... You're, you're right, my experience of kind of seeing from a window seat, so to speak, of all over the world, just seeing this kind of the, the humanity right in front of me, um, it's impacted me so much. And I think what I come away with and have come away with is, you know, all of us know what we know. We come from our own experiences. We all have different backgrounds and so many important you know, we all have so many things that, that we're passionate about, believe because of what we've experienced. And because I've, I've been exposed to what I have, learned about this issue, but also been able to travel and, and meet people all over the world, um, it's, it's, it's given me a voice. And I think that it's all about how every one of us has a voice and a place and I really believe we all have a missing piece. So I think that even going forward in this for myself personally, I couldn't stop learning or step down. Sometimes you've got to take breaks and do different <laughs> things and projects, but because of what I, I've known and learned, I can't let that go. It's, it's in me and it's, it's a passion for justice. But I really believe, and even for all the viewers tonight, you know, we all have a missing piece. And I believe you're a missing piece. You know, anybody watching this, we have something that we can do about this fight, this injustice. And it might be totally different than what Patrick is doing or what Way is doing or what I'm doing, but we all need each other. And I, I believe that when we engage, um, there's an author, Susan Patterson, she speaks out about human trafficking and uh, she has a book. In fact, I have it written down here somewhere. It's, um, <laughs> it's how you can fight human trafficking, a hundred ways to make a difference. 
And it's true. There's ways that even things we already do in our life, we like to bake, we like to host parties, we like to, to create music or videos or creative writing, um, whatever it is, we can use that same tool, the same gifts in us to make a difference, you know, in this fight for justice. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I just believe that what I've been exposed to has just given me, it's just caused my heartbeat to want to see yeah. uh, people engaged, to want to see liberty and freedom come to survivors, to want to see them become the world changers that many of them already are. It's, it's a huge amount of, uh, you know, there's a lot of pain in, in those lives and in what, what this is all about. There is hope and there's hope and there's a, always, always something that we can invest in or do to make an impact. And I think that hope is a message we need to, to be bringing up a lot when we're talking about this issue, because it is dark, yeah. um, but there's hope, there's hope. Yeah, I think when we when we first conceived of the idea of of having a film and art festival, it was it was kind of met with a lot of resistance. Uh, people, you can't you can't have a festival around something dark and heavy. <laughs> it's like, but but we wanted that to be the overriding message. Is that you know yeah when we when we really face this, when we look at it and, and acknowledge that this is happening in the world, and then we then we say yeah I'm going to do something to end it, no matter what that is. It's like your your message is so spot on, and that everybody has some way to contribute and it's and it's not the same for everyone um susan susan wrote her book susan's been very engaged in and now you know working with the faith community on human trafficking um we had um Zareen and and her husband on who made a you know they they went out and just made a documentary they'd never done it before but they they felt this kind of urgent need to contribute in some way to keeping kids safe and it's such a beautiful thing i think You've also had amazing experiences of meeting people through your work. Um, like I'm just thinking of Jeff Brodsky, but the, the people that you kind of run into, who you know are so impactful in this space, and and how exciting that is that you kind of get, you know, put together with people and, and the the end up really enriching you. Yeah. <laughs> Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Like so, some of the people that you've met and the people that you've run across through this work, you know, yeah. and as and as a flight attendant, but because um, I just, I find your life so completely fascinating. Yes, I'd love to. I have a couple of little props I brought here. With Excellent. Me. Um, this is so amazing to be engaged in this. I'm just, I'm probably not going to stop saying it, but thank you, Patrick, for this opportunity and way for this opportunity. Yeah, you're some of the people that I've met in this, in this, uh, this effort here. Jeff Brodsky, Dr. Jeff Brodsky and I have, uh, we've helped lead a lot of trainings in Anchorage, specifically for the Anchorage airport. And he's traveled to a lot of the other airports in Alaska. And uh, Jeff Brodsky, for those of you who don't know, he has a, his organization is Joy International. And he has a book called uh, The Least of These. And even a children's book about, uh, oh, I have it right here. Why are you barefoot? Um, and uh, he's amazing. So meeting Jeff Brodsky, I've, I've met him through our Airline Ambassadors International training that we do for airports. That's one of them. I have also have a friend, uh, Gina Lamort, and she is a fashion designer and a celebrity stylist. And her work, her work goes to, to fighting human trafficking. Um, Storyville Coffee is a, one of the best coffees I've ever had. They're based in Seattle. And uh, they contribute so much to fighting human trafficking um, to many organizations. I've, I've gotten to meet a lot of uh, people of celebrity just living in Los Angeles on flights and in my life and just, you know, in travels, I've gotten to meet a lot of celebrities and um, I help with projects with uh, ESPN, with the, the V Foundation and the ESPYs. And there's just so many people, even in that world, that I've met athletes that are doing something. Um, but yeah, it's 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 such an honor to meet and connect with people that are actually engaged in just going above their own lives and just being engaged to help other people out of this injustice. Um, there's yeah, just I, tons of people I can think of, but um, I'm really passionate about. Uh, businesses 
and organizations and people that that give uh, that give to this cause. And um, I, a friend of mine has a magazine for women it's called Darling Magazine. It's the art of being a woman. And her husband has a magazine for men and it's called Wilderness. And these are things that although they don't directly target human trafficking, they talk about goodness. They talk about area being involved in your society. And sometimes they do touch on that. But I just think it's so important, you know, that um, just that we taught we honor each other and what we're doing. And um, yeah, I, I'm so grateful for the people I've met. And I love that. I love the collaboration. I love the sense of connecting and creating and really joining forces. Yeah. If, in fact, that, that's a biggie because Patrick, you've said this too, but there's many organizations that are somewhat involved in, in this cause and in helping bring lives out of this injustice. And a lot of them don't know each other. So to have a platform like Sia End It Film and Arts Festival, bringing people together in that, that are all in this fight together, that's huge. Such, such a great tool and platform. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I, I really feel it in my bones. That's really like the more that we can kind of come together, recognize each other and then, and then support each other, the, the quicker we get you know, the, the results that we all really hope and pray for. Um, I, I've just been so touched by the, the book by Jeff Brodsky. Just, it just blew my mind. I mean, just so moved by, by his story. And uh, he's, he speaks on a panel. I, I, I believe he's on tomorrow night on the, at, at the opening of See It End It. Um, he'll be sharing some of his story. Um, but just his, his absolute commitment. And I think there are so many people you know, like that, that are just like, once they found out that this is happening to real human beings, this is, this is happening to people where their lives are being derailed and they, you know, through no fault of their own, you know, they're being forced into this, into this position where they're, they're having to give up, you know, their, their unique, you know, irreplaceable part to play in this world. And, you know, the, the meeting those people and having those those people share their stories is so powerful and, and impactful and like you said the you know it's like um if we see humanity and it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be this you know hardcore message about about human trafficking and to me it's like it's like prevention is is us becoming really good people it's like it's like when we start to really acknowledge each other and start to really feel our common humanity, and we start really living that way, human trafficking will 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 kind of be a byproduct. It, you know, it's kind of it's going to be something that's going to fade away. Um, and so, people like having those magazines. It doesn't have to be a message about human trafficking specifically, but it's encouraging us to be the people that are going to be a. We are the prevention of human trafficking, right? In how we live. Absolutely, I think uh, I agree a hundred percent. One of the things my friend Graham also says that he says, uh, what if it isn't all this horrible stuff in the world that is the biggest problem in our world? What if it was just simply the lack of goodness? Just the lack of goodness. And I think that's such a key. You know, there's so many places and areas right now that are needing help, that are needing care. When we're talking about human trafficking, but even the foster system, the education of our, our young people. There's so many arenas where just even bringing, seeing goodness being brought back into some of these places and goodness brought back into societies, the way we look at each other, the way we respect each other, the way we respect our, uh, you know, every, all of us are, are human beings. And I think it, it's so true. Like goodness could change the world. Yeah, it sounds so simple, but it's it's something that you know. And this has come up in, in other in other situations or in other conversations. But you know, noticing somebody that has a need, noticing somebody that's in pain, no, noticing noticing people, is is so critical to actually preventing human trafficking because it's that it's that feeling of, you know, I'm I'm out here on my own, and. And, and trying and trying to make sense of my life and, and then you have a you have a predator or an exploiter come into your life at that point you know you're and you're completely derailed you're you're knocked off from your you know the course that your life would would naturally follow 
but it's it, it's like we have so many opportunities to 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 stop that from happening just by being kind just by by allowing ourselves to notice people to to appreciate the people around us um and especially in our own homes i mean i think this is something with when i, I started working with father con or started father con it was that idea that we need to be so much more present in our own homes and in our own families too um and, and really aware of where of our children um there's just so many like the small ways and the great ways that people are contributing to ending human trafficking that are so beautiful. Yeah, I agree. You know, uh, we, we need more role models for children and young people and adults. We need the role models. We need exactly. people uh, like that are doing for the film and arts festival. We need people to create projects, uh, whether it's music, writing, films, things that, you know, can draw people in and make them feel heard and show goodness and show hope. And also, we again, back to the role models and people in positions, you know, there are vulnerable people out there. To an extent, we are all vulnerable, but we have people that are really vulnerable and young people that are looking for hope. They're looking for an answer. They may be looking for what they want to be or become. And I just, yeah, I just, uh, I'm thankful for the many people in my life that have been a support to me, um, family and friends and a lot of people that I've looked up to. And I just feel like that's a passion in me too, to be a voice to young people and to just dream big, to, to keep going. If you're in a situation that is not good to tell somebody there's hope, there's a way out. And, uh, we need we need more of that. We need more voices out there and more projects and creativity showing showing some some possibilities and and really giving us faith and hope again. And you mentioned you mentioned about foster care and that's like the, the second night of the festival is really addressing foster care. And one of the things that's really come through this is when you give a kid a chance, they do amazing things. And and to me that message is like we as a as a society you know, we're, we're letting kids fall through the cracks and those kids could be doing really great things. And that that's, that's too high a price for, for us to lose the, you know, what one human being can do um, is, so, is, is so significant and so important. And we're letting people just kind of drop through the cracks of these, you know, systems. And, uh, and it just takes a person taking an interest in, in engaging. Um, yeah, I, we, we feature a few, there's a few stories that we, we featured in the film festival, but just, you know, people that were given a chance, given an opportunity, and they've really kind of just run with it. And and these are kids that would have been so easy to overlook, you know, just, I don't know, that, that kind of thing just drives me nuts that, that we're, we're letting so many, so many people slip through the cracks of, of systems when it, when it takes an individual kind of stepping up, right? And, Absolutely. And it, yeah, I, and that takes me back to, you know, I've gotten to know very closely and work with uh, survivor leaders that, that have come out of human trafficking and um, survived. And uh, also a friend, Alicia Kosakevich, she's a abduction, child abduction survivor. She speaks on behalf of, of or at a lot of our human trafficking awareness events. But uh, Alicia, uh, my friend Donna Hubbard, Kelly Dorr, who's been featured on on this platform yeah. these people are amazing they're literally on the front lines and um you know i can think of so many others that i know harold de souza yeah right um, that was featured on here look at that i mean just the impact of one life being in, brought out of that world and the impact that they have it really is a missing piece that's going to help somebody else and so yeah we we need we need to see uh people people pulled out of this, kids reached out of this, and prevention uh, yep. for potential human trafficking or other things, but. What, what, what do you, in the trainings that, that, that um, Airline Ambassadors offers, like what do you focus on in your trainings? I mean, is it, does it, is it, is it like human trafficking 101 or is it, you know, like what, what all do you present? Yeah, great question. So um, sometimes we're training at doing a live training for an airport where it's all kinds of airport employees. Sometimes we are, uh, we've worked with 
some of the leadership of airlines and done a training for them and they'll take that and and do their own curriculum for their airline but we talk about you know in the airline in the airports and on the planes how do you how do you engage in, in pl apply that same level of safety training that we get but apply the awareness of human trafficking so how do you recognize the signs what are some of the signs it's going to look a little different on an airplane or po possibly in an airport than maybe some other places um, but it's it's proven you know traffickers they use the means of of travel they use all of our industries to to uh, transport victims around and sometimes it's blatant uh, sometimes like in international airports I've seen you see much more possible signs of, of labor tra trafficking and people in lines uh, in customs that are going for work in a different nation um, but it looks different in the US sometimes it's covered up and so we talk about the vulnerabilities the signs what what could a human trafficking victim look like what could a survivor who could they be and how to recognize that and report it and we really emphasize you know to to not cause alarm there's a protocol involved but to be aware to be observant if there's signs that seem like a uh, human trafficking or any kind of other violent violent abuse then you must report it and you can do so anonymously and airlines have their own set protocols, but we do a, uh, we talk about a protocol, we share, we have law enforcement share, uh, we partner with other experts and organizations that will share from their platform. <laughs> but as a flight attendant and a representative of the airlines, I would talk about, okay, what are some, what are some uh, possibilities that could happen on a plane or, at, or in an airport? And how do you, how do you, what action do you take? And uh, that varies, but definitely we emphasize anything you see, report it, say something, be a voice. There's no harm if you're wrong. Yeah, that's so great. I, I think we have a video of the Charlotte Airport training. Oh, oh good. Why don't, why don't we go ahead and play that and, okay. uh, and then you can comment. Charlotte Ops 267 coming from uh, Orlando. Uh, we have an unusual situation with a passenger, a male and a female, in seats 10 D and E. I'd like. To this is a there. training scenario. Can you, can you describe her to me? I think she's about 16. These air crews at the Charlotte, North Carolina International Airport are learning to recognize victims of sex trafficking. And you live in Providence. Donna Hubbard, a flight attendant and a trafficking survivor, is one of the trainers. I'm looking to see if those children look like they are frightened, anxious, um, if they're traveling with someone who even looks like them. Airline Ambassadors International has trained more than 6,000 airline employees worldwide. But the International Labor Organization estimates that nearly 5 million people worldwide were victims of sex trafficking in 2016. Wolf says talking about it is the first step to stopping it. Carolyn Prasuti, VOA News, Charlotte, North Carolina. I actually have a few questions in chat about um, how knowledgeable do you think the airlines are with trafficking and like how much has it changed the past like 10, 20 years? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that airlines are, a lot of us all over the place are still learning about this more and more, but um, even in the past five years, I don't, I'm trying to think back further, but in the last five years, airlines have taken a real initiative. Um, many of the international airlines that we know and the US-based major carriers have uh, signed on or they've uh, contracted with anti-human trafficking organizations to develop their own training and protocol. Um, and a lot of, I, I've been able to contribute to some training modules and training for, uh, for the different airlines. And um, it's getting better. It, uh, some airlines even will show something in their media, their online video streaming. They'll have, they'll have 
put something out about being aware, which is great. We need a lot more of that. I think that uh, a lot of airlines are starting to tackle this much more aggressively than before. It's so important that we have everybody in an airport and an airline setting that it's a safe zone when we're going through our airports and are getting on our flights. So what I've seen is training has started to come for our TSA, our uh, airport police, yeah. all levels, even the, the vendors for food and shops in airports. We see all these things being implemented, which is great because it it's creates layers of defense, really. Layers that somebody is passing through the system of travel and airlines. There are multiple people at each layer that are going to be aware. So we're far from being done with, with this, you know, with this kind of training, but airports and airlines have been engaging more, especially in the recent years. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, I've, I've been able to travel internationally and one of the projects we worked on with Airline Ambassadors International, we helped Air Asia with an anti-trafficking roadshow. They were finding, um, this was a couple, three years ago, they were finding so many reports of human trafficking um, that were val validated um, and they needed to do something. So uh, my friend Donna, Nancy and I, we went there and we helped lead these uh, different training sessions with other organizations that are on the ground. We went all over Southeast Asia and it was a huge draw. And then they took, uh, the airline themselves took some of that and they implemented it to make sure their whole airline was brought training and awareness. And uh, Japan Airlines is another airline. We've had specific airlines that we've gotten to help even uh, the training staff become aware of this so that they can take it to their airlines. And we, we've done that in the United States too. So we're making headway. Um, it's just so important that we keep going. What about, what about like, a pa like passengers? Um, where if a passenger overhears something or, you know, or sees something odd on the plane, like what would be, what would be your recommendation for a passenger in that kind of situation? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Yeah. Anybody, if you're on a flight and you see something that is evidence that it could be human trafficking or something, any kind of safety hazard or abuse, um, talk to a flight attendant talk to them, but also make sure you don't just stop there. Tell, gather as much details, ob be observant, gather as much details as possible, tell a flight attendant, but there's also a way to report it anonymously through the National Human Trafficking Hotline. You can report anything actually via text, um, text to be free, the words, and you can actually get give details to somebody on the other end. It's it's anonymous, but if you see something that is that could be danger and could be human trafficking, tell somebody. Tell a flight attendant if you're on the airplane. If you're in an airport, you see something or hear a conversation or you see signs that could be this. Talk to airport police and security. Go to whoever you can, and if it's an emergency situation and you're on the ground. Um, and you're witnessing something that is an actual emergency, call 911. Um, and when you provide your details in this observation, if you believe somebody's life is being threatened, that this is an actual threat, tell that to the officer or who you're reporting it to. I've learned from law enforcement, you know, there's one thing to provide a tip. And if you're unsure, and if you're questioning things, that's okay. You can give them the tip or the observation and details that you have. But if there's a real emergency, make sure you let who you're reporting it to know that you believe it's life-threatening. I actually want to learn a little bit more uh, no, about cases. Like, what are some of the cases of trafficking through airlines that you know of? Yeah, you know, there's been many. Um, we hear and see these in the news. Um, I myself have uh, both when I've been working on a flight and when I've been traveling as a passenger in airports, I've reported several things myself and 
most of the time you don't know what the outcome is, but your duty then is to just give that information and report what you're seeing. Um, there was a customer ser ser uh, service agent in Sacramento recently, and she saw signs of uh, two young women that were on their way. They had, they had a ticket, they had a one-way ticket, they were young, they approached her uh, at the ticket counter and she had all kinds of red flags. They didn't know exactly who was meeting them. They had uh, tried to make phone calls to find out if they had a return ticket home. There were all kinds of red flags and they seemed really nervous. They hardly had anything with them. So she looked into it and uh, with an officer as well and they found out, sure enough, uh, these girls were about to be trafficked. And in that specific case, um, the trafficker had posed as an online, I think it was Instagram, social media account that yeah. looked like it had many followers and they were excited to be going on this trip with very little information other than what they saw on this social media account. And as soon as the officer got these girls into a safe area, they, he checked the, the Instagram account and in seconds it had been deleted. So, you know, we see a, and hear a lot. I have colleagues that have reported seeing people that were traveling to meet somebody they were dating online that they hadn't met before. And uh, a lot of that, something to watch out for. You know, one sign is if you're having a conversation with somebody or hear something on an airplane and, and an individual could be young person or of any age, men or women, young girl or boy, they don't know who's meeting them on the other end or they're on a one-way ticket, or they met somebody online, they think they're traveling for a legitimate job, but they don't know who's picking them up at the, at the other end. These are all signs that it's worth looking into and being more observant, and if necessary, asking questions in a non-threatening way to get more information. And as flight attendants, when we're on an airplane, we're just, we're there observing. We're there to maintain the safety of an airplane. So when, colleagues and myself have seen something uncomfortable. As a team, we all make sure we're observant and we know any details. We'll come to a conclusion, okay, are, are there signs of, you know, it, is this person traveling alone? Are they a, a child? Are they traveling with their family? Is this a family dynamic? You know, just those things that you can start asking yourself. Are they scared? Can they speak the language? Do they know who's meeting them? Those kind of things uh, we're just being aware of and observing. Um, but yeah, there's many, many incidents uh, that I have heard of where it's people are being groomed online by somebody maybe on social media, somebody that poses to be a partner, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and they take that trip and they don't know what they're getting into after that. And that could also be uh, false jobs and things like that too. Um, but yeah, there's, there's many, many, uh, cases that have been in fact evidence, you know, people have been rescued from human trafficking. There, there was one that, that I had heard of, of the, the girl traveling with a, an older guy and the flight attendant kind of made contact, eye contact with her. And then they left a notepad and a pencil in the restroom. Are you familiar with that, that case? Yeah, you know, and that's one um, that, yeah, that's one that brought a lot of light to this issue. And, um, you know, some of it is we hear, we hear some of these stories of, you know, these accounts of it happening and somebody reporting it. And um, I think it's good. We just need, we need to keep reporting and, and doing something when we see something that is unsafe. Yeah. Yeah, so so often the the feeling is like, well, I don't really know, so I I shouldn't say anything. But I think we've heard we've heard so many, and that's the other thing I want to really highlight is is the stories where someone actually did notice something, say something, and it resulted in someone's life being saved. Because we also need to hear those hear those stories. Right. And it's so easy just to kind of, you know, it's none of my business. You know, I don't really know all the all the circumstances, so I'll just kind of not get involved. But it could be it could be life and death for for a young person. Absolutely. What what is the age for for a like a teenager to fly alone? Is there is there like an age where they 
where they're allowed to, to fly alone? You know, it varies by airline, um, but sometimes children can be uh, of a certain age and it, it varies and they can travel by themselves being, uh, but at each end, at the end of the flight and before the flight, they would have an assistant, a representative from the airline helping them. Um, but yeah, it varies, but yeah, you, it can, any, if you look at the numbers, it can be very young people that are traveling and that could possibly be on an airplane by themselves. Yeah, my, my daughters flew from Japan to Los Angeles. Wow. And they were 12 and nine. Wow. And, uh, and then they were really helped by the, the staff um, and made sure that they, that they were handed over to the right people when they got there, <laughs> thank God. Um, but, you, but you just wonder, you know, like what, you know, like how, how careful airline staff would be in handing, in handing over a child to, you know, a supposed uncle or somebody like that, that, because um, that does seem to be a pattern that you have people representing themselves as a family member or an uncle or somebody like that, you know, there to, to retrieve a child, whether it's from the hospital or, um, or on an airline, something like that. Well, absolutely. Yeah, uh, it's, I want to make clear too, you know, uh, it actually, it feels very safe when we're on an airplane. It's just as, as flight attendants, we're there to maintain that safety. So we call it this flight attendant instinct. You really start to recognize if there's kind of unusual behavior. Everyone's on this metal tube together, yeah. you yeah. know, and, and you notice funny things, you know, people are a little, they act a little differently when they travel. Some people don't travel that often. Um, and some people are scared to fly. So there's all kinds of little things that we are already noticing on board, but it's when there's that something that stands out that's not right. And it seems like there's, there's just something not right with this situation. I get that, that gut feeling. And that's what's been found in a lot of times to, to usually lead, it, it could be something. You've got to listen to that. And thankfully, uh, you know, I think our air, we're getting better. We're getting better and people are getting more aware. Um, but when you step on an air, airplane, the people on board are there to keep you safe. And, and you know, we, we're trained to know when something's not safe. So I think that is, that's a really positive thing, but it's those instances where maybe we don't see something and maybe a passenger does. That's why, you know, it's so important to, to say something, to make sure you say something. You, there's, there's nothing that can go wrong with just expressing your concern about something. What, what do you think, how, how responsive are the airlines? Like say, for example, passengers requested of the airline to please show some kind of message about human trafficking while they're flying, you know, like just to put up an announcement, something like that. Would the airlines be responsive if people are, are requesting, you know, that that from the airlines? Yeah, I think you know they there has been some of that already. There's there's getting to be more exposure uh, during times we've done a lot of uh, trainings before events like the Super Bowl, and right. so we've worked with different airlines and airports that are like the airports that are hosting the Super Bowl, and you're starting to see things put up in airports. Um, especially in airports, uh, a lot of them around the country, whether it's in the restrooms, there's things being posted about looking out for human trafficking and how to report it. And if there's somebody out there that is in trouble, you know, there's, there's ways that they can see that. Airlines, yes, I think there's a little more, uh, there's more restrictions, but yeah, but yeah there's, there's progress being made with that. I think that we could see more of that. Um, but yeah, we, they're doing it to some extent, but it'd be great to see, see more, you know? Yeah. I think, I know that there were campaigns done with different, like, like, uh, public transportation buses and things, you know, having more messaging there. Yeah, um, it, it just does seem like, you know, having just a reminder because so often it's, it's, you don't know what you're seeing. And I think that's a thing that's so valuable about what you're, you know, the trainings that you provide, because it's like you see something and you sense that something's off. But if you haven't really learned about human trafficking, then you, you don't know what you're looking at. You don't know what you're seeing. 
and and without without kind of being able to to you know connect the dots you know you just, you don't say anything you know so so i just like i'm so grateful for what you're doing because i think that's you know allowing people to to know what they're seeing and and that ha that's happened with law enforcement the 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 trainings being provided by survivors you know survivor leaders that are now working with law enforcement to train law enforcement to know what they're seeing you know because they're seeing some you know bad kid who's being ornery and obnoxious and not cooperative um and then and blaming her when she's actually under under threat and and duress by a trafficker and and until they recognized this behavior wasn't you know it wasn't just this being a a, a nasty a nasty kid but this is a this is a child who's been taken and groomed and and forced into a situation that's that's resulting in that behavior and and so the more people are actually getting trained to to know what they're seeing the the more quickly we can kind of you know interrupt what's happening in their lives Absolutely. so yeah it's so fantastic what you're doing as an industry and i think it you know for anyone out there like whatever industry you're in whatever you know work you're doing whether it's you know uber and lyft we need uber and lyft drivers trained to know you know what they're seeing as well um we need we need just so many different industries that are intersecting with with trafficking victims at some point and the more that they can they can recognize what they're seeing the better um do you do you does airline ambassadors international does that only do training for within the airline industry or do you kind of go also into like hotels like yeah, good question. We have uh, we have done some training training with hotels, like you said, hotels. Uh, I know airline ambassadors uh, Nancy and some others. They helped with a big event overseas, and it was with Interpol and police. And uh, yeah, so we've done outside kind of the focus since it's airline ambassadors international, sure. and most of us are involved in the airline industry. That's been a lot of the focus, but yeah, we've done trainings with universities and uh, schools and local communities. And um, so it's not limited to just the airlines. I I was able to speak with Harold D'Souza um, a couple years ago. It was a it it was called the San Francisco Collaborative Against Human Trafficking, and it was all industries represented the judicial, the justice industry, uh, education. There were even massage parlors the people involved in the industries were all sharing what their platforms were and what they were doing. So that was really amazing to be there and speak on, represent the airline industry. Um, but so, yeah, we partner with many, many, and also many other organizations, human trafficking uh, awareness organizations and those that are in that fight too. Yeah, yeah, we, we need a lot more of that collaboration. That's true. Did you have a question, Wei? Um, Yeah, actually, I was wondering about like, you know, since the pandemic, we have like so much social distancing, we have to wear masks. How has that really affected like being able to spot what's going on, like on the plane? Yeah, it's different. It's such a different world. You know, um, it, a lot of ways the airlines really upped their safety in this time frame by keeping the environment safe keeping the you know the cleanliness and all of that safe and i think it it really created this i almost feel like i've been more aware because you know we're all wearing masks we're socially distanced there's not a lot of in-flight service some of that's coming back slowly but it was an opportunity to even if you might not be in front of that person or around them for very long it, it's you're almost more connected because i feel like people are very aware and alert right now and uh, it, it is a little more challenging because you can't engage in conversation or the time spent like it, like it used to be. But it, yeah, it's definitely a different dynamic. And I think everywhere, yeah. when you get on an airplane, um, I think it's, it's just really, I, I almost feel like we're more observant because we have more time. We have more time to uh, even assess what's going on around us it's just that barrier from really seeing everybody's smile or talking with people, but there's still an opportunity to connect. It's different though. 
yeah, I think what, what a lot of people, I mean, I know, I know when the pandemic first started, there was this kind of like hope that somehow this would reduce human trafficking, but, um, you know, quite to the contrary, it's, there's things have been stepped up. And, and if you start to, th to think, you know, for a trafficker, if this is his, this is his or her source of income is, is I mean, they're, they're not going to let a reduction in their income happen. And so they're going to be pushing girls into more and more dangerous situations and pushing their, their, you know, their the people that they're victimizing and that they're putting out there. They're going to be expecting more of them. Already, they're they're not they're not looking after the best interests or the health of the of the people that they're forcing to to work. And so the pandemic is just one more one more risk, um, which which the trafficker is willing to have them take, um, which is which is really disturbing. I mean, just the. That, that, that this is actually an, on some levels it's actually increasing and for me my my concern is that we're seeing kids today being groomed to be trafficked tomorrow and and with with so many kids online and so few of them actually being supervised um that there we're gonna there, that there is the potential for a, a, a real upsurge in trafficking coming um, and i think with labor trafficking as well you have a lot of people are losing their jobs so there's there's going to be more more predators are going to be preying on that population that's lost their jobs so there is a there is a real like a, a necessity for awareness now like that we that we're taking advantage of the pandemic also to get the word out to people you know to get to get ahead of the curve because there there is going to be more kind of more more kind of predatory behavior um coming on the back of the pandemic yeah, you're right. It's such a need for more uh, awareness, internet safety, and and all kinds of things. And um, yeah, uh, you know, uh, when you said labor trafficking, um, yeah, that's one that's that's often neglected. And uh, domestic servitude, things like yeah. that, are happening in the United States and all over. Um, one of the something that came up to airline ambassadors about that. Uh, about almost two years ago, uh, Airline Ambassadors International was alerted to a case uh, involving young women in Sierra Leone, Africa, that had been recruited for jobs in the Middle East, specifically Kuwait. And it was they were false jobs. It, they ended up being put into domestic servitude and many, many abusive situations in Kuwait. And so airline ambassadors heard from this young man, Ibrahim Bangura. One of his uh, relatives was actually one of the young women trafficked. So they would communicate with him and he communicated with us. Thankfully, we knew the protocol of reporting things here in the US and were able to connect to organizations in Kuwait. And through a long process, uh, because of Ibrahim reaching out and helping uh, 48 women of of this of Sierra Leone were, were repatriated and brought back. Um, sadly, some were not. Some were not able to get out. And, and we're learning more and more of this. And although that's not in the US, that was one of those cases where uh, we were able to report this and, and these women were brought back. So it's been a success in that way. But there's so much more needed because we're finding that in the Middle East, specifically Kuwait, Syria, Oman, uh, Lebanon, and United Arab Emirates, it's it's a big hub for domestic servitude. And that was just something that left a big imprint on me because I would communicate with some of these women when they were brought out of their homes and the places they were staying. In Kuwait, they were brought to a shelter and waiting their repatriation. And and I would talk with, especially one, um, I'll call her Tia. We would communicate through WhatsApp and it was it was like, wow, I, you know, just, I was praying and hoping that they would get brought out of there and, and they eventually did. So now with Ibrahim and with Kelly Dorr and Airline Ambassadors International, we're helping with this project uh, that Ibrahim started, the Sierra Cares Foundation, 10 years ago, helping orphans and now assisting survivors of human trafficking. And we're going to continue to, to support what, what their futures are and uh, training so that people aren't lured from these recruiting 
games because it's a big a big deception in that yeah but it's it's so amazing to be involved with kelly door and sierra cares foundation because we're seeing uh, orphans children people that are vulnerable there and survivors that are going to be they're being given their life back they're being given purpose and i can't wait to see what they do yeah that's that is just so exciting you know to kind of see someone who's who's been given their, a chance at a life again and to see what they do with it that is just so inspiring How, in those cases did you find like cooperation from the governments or like how did how did that that work as far as getting them re returned to their homes yeah um, big process it was oh, about a year to get all of that and um it was a huge process so it connecting with our human traf national human trafficking hotline in the u.s they were able to provide organizations on the ground in kuwait and in the middle east and it was a real group effort of communicating back and forth and learning from ibrahim about the specifics and uh but because this is happening so often there's limited space and shelters and safe houses and it's it is a process to be able to get them uh repatriated uh lots of back and forth and a lot of the work with that was the organization specifically in kuwait um but still we were all on call to be relaying the details that we knew and um just seeing that unfold and i'm so thankful for being able to know some of the people that are on the front lines in this so we, we could we knew what to do we knew who to contact to yeah that's just that's so fantastic i, I just love that that story um because I, i've heard of other cases of of that kind of domestic servitude where be, because the the family a lot of times is very um established in the community or they have they have wealth behind them that that there is kind of complications with bringing cases against them and yeah. and uh it feels so so sad because you realize that that person who's being exploited or being trafficked is you know can just feel like like hopeless and and so what what you provide and what these organizations provide is really that sense that you matter and i think that that so many victims of human trafficking they've, they've had this drummed into them that they really don't matter and nobody cares about them mm -hmm. um, in fact nobody sees them and and that's what we have to change and i think you know that's something that all of us just like opening our eyes and being willing to see other human beings as human beings you know is such a huge defense you know against you know further exploitation and and also these opportunities for for escape or or deliverance from their situations oh, um yeah. i remember i read this a, a book about a i think it's called slave and it was a girl who was trafficked from from sudan and and she she had been she had been dragged from her family sold in khartoum and then um this family that basically owned her and used her one of their relatives was working at the embassy in london and they were going to have a baby so they ended up sending her to work um to work in the home of this of this family that was connected to the embassy and uh the, the complication for her and finally somebody noticing her somebody listening to her and then like helped her escape and uh and eventually tell her story it was so powerful and we just we just don't don't realize how much this is happening around the world and and even here in America. Oh, so true. Yeah, I I feel so honored to know some amazing survivor leaders. They've really made an impact on me. And uh, even the young woman I would communicate with in Sierra Leone, very limited communication, but just being able to see her and the impact that she has had on my life it uh sometimes we talk about it and it seems like a problem out there and yeah that 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 connection i just i'm so grateful for that because that was an honor for that was an honor to meet her life and she is gonna i know she's gonna do so many amazing things and have some wonderful things happen in her life and that just means everything that's so great um, what do you think are some of the misconceptions that, that the public has about human trafficking 
that that make it make it harder to kind of bring about the results that we would like i mean what are, what are some of the misconceptions people have that you run into in in giving trainings and those kind of things yeah i think it, sometimes people think it just happens in a different country or it happens just to children um yeah and it really it happens everywhere even here in los angeles we've had things that have happened in orange county and um, Beverly Hills, where we find that businesses were operating in, literally in human trafficking and, um, and individuals that have also been found in domestic servitude in very, very uh, affluent areas. And it does happen here. And I think a lot of, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, vulnerability right now is online. And it's, it's, it's on being having the internet and access is such an amazing tool and it's an amazing way we can have communication and but there's so much uh precaution needed and awareness for internet safety and that is all over the world but also here um i think yeah i think that's a, that's a big one yeah the, the the border borders don't mean as much anymore with the internet it's like you know, and, and and location, geography doesn't matter as much now because you have no idea who you're talking to, you know. And and for a lot of kids who 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 don't learn those kind of precautions, it's extremely dangerous. Um, yeah, we've had a few people. Opal Singleton. I don't know. Do you know Opal? I don't know if I do. She she's with a million kids, and so oh. they worked in Cambodia, but also she works here. Um, I think in the Riverside area. But she's she's just remarkable. So she was on and talking about kind of cyber safety and oh wow, and yeah. she's she's so great because she like she's like re retired from as a CEO of a company and said you know and she then she discovered human trafficking. But um, she loves the internet. She just she really loves the technology. So so she feels so committed to kind of making it safe and uh, yeah, just kind of re remarkable person. Yeah, you'd love her. <laughs> I would love her. That's so great. <laughs> Yeah. So what what do you do you have any any upcoming plans anything you know on your horizon that you would like to share about or is there anything Yeah. Well, thank you. I am super super excited and passionate about uh, helping with the Sierra Cares Foundation. Right now, um, this is where the the young women got brought back to Sierra Leone and we have a uh, the Air Cares Foundation just became a U.S.-based nonprofit organization. Thankfully, with the help of Donna Hubbard, Kelly Dorr, many airline ambassadors international, and uh, we're able to create a place where there's a sponsorship happening, where people are being able to sponsor children in education with food and also sponsor survivors of human trafficking there. And there is so much opportunity. And these kids are beautiful and these people are beautiful and we're able to engage on zoom calls with uh, some of the sponsors and donors and it's just it's it's so incredible to see these people on the other side of the world that that uh, are going to be able to do great things and these kids that are yeah, yeah. in education they're going to be able to have a future and hopefully you know whether some of the survivors want to tell their story in the future or not, they're going to be given empowered to, to do things in their life and, and be successful and be a voice. So I'm, that's one of the main things I've been focusing on recently. What, what is it? What is it like a contact for that organization? Like the, yeah. through the website? Is it, can you spell it out? Yes, I will. So um, our website is, just about up. It's not up for Sierra Cares yet, but uh, you can go to airlineamb.org slash Sierra Cares Foundation. So it's and airline AMB as in boy, like airline ambassadors, airlineamb.org slash Sierra Cares Foundation. And Sierra is S-I-E-R-R-E. -R -R -E. It's S I E R R A. A, okay. Cares, C A R E A E S Foundation. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> but um, 
Yeah, that's that's something I've been working on. I've really been able to, um, I've, I've been a part of our flight attendant union, our uh, air safety, health and security committee. That's been a platform where we've gotten to really talk about things of keeping our airlines safe. And so that's been something I've invested on, in as well. Um, and then, you know, right now the Sierra Cares Foundation has been, it, it, it's kind of alive and happening right now. And so that's what I'm really invested in. Yeah, that's so great. Um, Way, do we have any other, any questions? No, I, I'm just <laughs> glad we were able to learn so much tonight about like what's yeah. going on, how the training goes for airlines, because that's something that like our community has always been really interested in when it comes to like international trafficking or like what's going on when people are being transported and having to hear your personal experience, your background, your training, I think like you were able to answer so many questions for us that it's extremely meaningful. And I'm really grateful we we're able to have you on stream tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I am so proud of you guys and really so grateful to be connected to you. Yeah, me as well. I, th I think you're, you're missing too. I mean, I just really, I really hope people can catch the feeling like when in your work with CR cares, it's, you know, if we can take care of, when we can take care of children, who are who are growing up, especially kind of if they're in uh, orphans or with foster care, if if, you, if they're taken care of, they're not going to become exploitable. I mean, the 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 way that we can prevent this from from growing is by taking care of those, you know, the least of these, as as Jeff talks. But yeah. um, when we start to kind of really, you know, it, it doesn't have to be this kind of you know the, the concept of the girl under the bed getting dragged out. I mean, it, it's. This this concept of rescue that so many people have in, in their minds, to to me, it's like the, the the real rescue is happening before that. If we can start to really take care of kids, like like you're doing through Sierra Cares and and so many other people, taking care of taking care of kids so that they know that they're valued, they know that they're worth, that, that their lives have worth, they know that they're loved. Um, that that makes a person so much less vulnerable to being exploited and, and preyed upon. And so I just really hope that, that everyone can catch that feeling and that, that you know, really understand that, um, that when we really look after each other, when we look after, after kids who are in vulnerable positions in their lives, um, this, this is contributing to preventing and ending human trafficking. It, it's not, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be the, the lofty, you know, starting an organization and petitioning the president. It, it's, it's when we take care of kids who are in a vulnerable situation, we're preventing greater and, and more trafficking happening. Um, I just want to remind people um, a little bit that see in the festival officially starts tomorrow night. If you guys have not registered, it is free. We have command in chat. Um, Thank you so much, everyone, yeah. for being a part of this. We also have our YouTube, our socials. Make sure you follow us on See it, End It. Um, subscribe to our YouTube. We are going to have so many more amazing guests, just like tonight, to come on, and we get to learn a little bit about the organization, a little bit about what they do. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. We are currently rating a BIPO tonight. So please, remember, send some love. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. And thank you, Wei. We make this all happen. The, the magic maker there. Um, and please go, please register um, at seeitended.com or Eventbrite um, for the festival. You'll have six days of people like Andrea, amazing people that you're going to be introduced to. Um, thank you so much. So we'll see you next week on Tuesday. Yes. Have a good night. Thank you okay. so thank much. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. Yeah.